what I'd like to do is ask Alison to introduce herself. Alison is the author of this book, which is called Wicked Warriors and Evil Emperors. And that's what we're going to be talking about in association with the exhibition downstairs. The first emperor, what that time was like, how barbaric it really was, and what an extraordinary rise to power the first emperor had. So, Alison, would you mind just introducing yourself uh, my name's Alison Lloyd and as Gretel said I'm the author of this children's book but I've also written uh, a couple of novels as well. I like writing stuff that's set in historical settings. Um, Pre-authorship pre I used to work for the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade so I'm no stranger to international intrigues and conflicts and diplomatic secrets um, of which there are a few in this book as well. Yep, there absolutely are. And over there, with his artistic haircut, is our artist. You can always spot the artist, can't you? Although you're... What? <laughs> but you're quite well-dressed. Well done. And no spatterings of paint. I dress myself. <laughs> well done. Now, Terry, introduce oh, yourself. because I'm, I'm Terry. I'm a writer and an illustrator of children's books. Um, not confident to go beyond that. Um, I'm also a partner painter, um, a fledgling painting career starting up. Um, I have done probably a hundred odd books, um, mainly humour based. Um, occasionally I, um, I come to contact with reality, but generally I'm in the world of the imagination. Um, love using colour. Um, and for me, I grew up in a house of boys, so humour is kind of uh, it's a language I understand. So what we've got is the two sides here. We've got fabulous, brutal facts about the time that the first emperor emerged, counterbalanced by the absolute whimsy and irreverence of you, correct? So what we thought we'd do is use some of these illustrations to launch us into various parts of the subject matter so that you guys, it's an amazing exhibition. Who's seen it yet? Is that a sentence? Who's seen it yet? Who's seen it? <laughs> Sometimes I wonder if English is my first language. Have you seen it? No. Well, put your... <laughs> you have. Well done, and you have too. Good. Good on you. All right. And you have. Well done. Well, isn't that good? All right. You're going to see it afterwards. <laughs> Terrific. All right. So what we want to do... Alison, can you... They're called warring times. Prior to these states, are there six or seven states of China that are brought together? Mm. Well, the first emperor is called, given that title, because he was, of course, the first emperor. And really his story starts uh, in the middle of the third century BC when the China that we recognise today and the borders that we see today um, weren't there. And what they had instead was a land that they called Tianxia, which means everything under heaven. To them, to the people, the black-haired people of that land, it was the whole world. And um, by the mid-third century BC, it had been through over two centuries of constant civil war, basically. Uh, at the time of the first emperor's birth, there were seven states, but the states sort of, you know, ate, ate each other, new states were born and so forth. Um, and so when the first emperor was born, not many people realise this, but he was actually the son of a hostage. Uh, his father was a fairly obscure prince who'd been sent to a neighbouring state um, as a kind of uh, human peace treaty. That's exactly right. Well done. And so <laughs> what we're going to do... Would you mind, Terry, showing us the first illustration? Because... It's not a competition, Terry. So, now Terry has done this. This is an illustration out of the book. Could you read it for those of us who didn't wear our glasses? He can't read. All right. Now, the reason we're showing that one is your mic working? Is it working? Is it only me that couldn't hear? What did you think I said? Mind. No, your microphone. You girls are drunk. <laughs> Is it working? All right, so we say, let us unleash the mighty power of the pointed stick. Now, the reason we're looking at that one, could you tell us, please, Alison, in this warring time, 
We're talking millions and millions of soldiers within yes. Yes. This, these states. Yep. Um, an estimate has been made by some historian or other that, um, based on the writings that we have surviving from the time, that in the last 130 years of the Warring States period, one and a half million soldiers died. And that's just soldiers on the battlefield. And we're talking about a total population in China of somewhere around 40 million. So 1.5 million people in just over a century is massive bloodshed, really. And um, the most, the bloodiest battle in ancient history actually happened at this time, was the Battle of Chongqing, at which somewhere around half a million people were killed. One of the interesting things about this, though, was also, it, it, it wasn't just people running in and killing each other. It seems to have been very intellectually scrutinised. Is that right? Could you just yeah. give us some... Yeah. Could you tell us about the cows and the horns? Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, this is the what I call the dastardly dragon strategy, where um, there was an army that was besieging a city. And in those days, all Chinese cities had walls around them, big earthen walls, massive earthen walls to protect them. So this city had been besieged for about five years and um, the people within it were of course uh, beginning to run out of food and supplies and things were getting pretty desperate inside the town. Um, and they were looking for a way to end the siege. So they came up with this strategy whereby step one was quite clever. They sent um, presents out to the uh, surrounding army to sort of soften up the general and said to them, look, you know, we can see you're winning and, you know, we just, please treat us nicely when you defeat us. Um, and the general was naturally very delighted to get these gifts and uh, he accepted them and his army began to relax a bit. And then, of course, when the people who were inside the city saw this, they thought, right, right well, this is the time. So they actually... Um, created a hole inside their own wall and one moonless night when all was dark they took a herd of cattle brought inside the city for food supplies of course uh, they took a herd of cattle and they painted them and they attached uh, torches to the horns and the tail of the cattle and lit them and then drove the cattle in a stampede out through the hole in the city walls into the surrounding army camp in the middle of the night. And uh, the surrounding soldiers, who might have been asleep or might have been boozing or whatever soldiers would do in their camps, thought they were being attacked by dragons and um, split. And that was the end of the siege. And there was another one too where they... We had, of course, the man who wrote The Art of War. Yeah. Can you pronounce his name for me? Sun Tzu. Yeah. Right, I say Sun Tzu, <laughs> but others say Sun Tzu. And one of the things he did to prove how to lead properly yes. was with the, the emperor's actual wives. Is that right? Can you... Pre the emperor, he was actually the king. Yes. Okay, this so tell me... This is the time when we've got still different states at war with each other. Um, and uh, he... Yes, he said, yes, I can lead your troops. And the king said, well, prove it. I'll give you, I bet you can't lead an army of women. Because unfortunately, um, you know, women were looked down upon as being brainless, stupid creatures that were totally unsuitable for war or anything much except the usual, really. Um, but so Sunza said, yep, I can do it. And uh, he had divided the women up into groups, taught them the signals for how to um, move, you know, if you do, if I hit this gong, you march straight ahead, the banner dips this way, you march left, etc., etc. He taught them the signals, and he said, right, now we're doing it for real. Um, and the first attempt was a total failure, and the women just fell about in giggles and uh, laughed their heads off, and it, that was no good. And Sunzo apologised to the king and said, okay, well, you know, if... Uh, if the troops don't understand the um, instructions, then it's the commander's fault, so I will try again. And he tried again, and again the women fell about laughing. And this time Sunza said, right, well, the troops understand the instructions, they're refusing to obey. And this is the officer's problem, not the commander's. So he ordered that the heads of the king's two favourite wives be 
taken off on the spot. Um, and then he issued the orders to march again, and this time he got instant obedience, funnily enough. Well, chopping people's heads off was quite a, a fashion, really, wasn't it? <laughs> yes, it's a good look. <laughs> <laughs> Cherry, what, is that the one that you're doing over at the moment there? And what does that say, please? Do I have to read again? Yes, please. <laughs> OK, I think I've got the idea now, says the one. <laughs> so if you... Come on. Would you like more information? Yes, I would. OK. But Alison just gave me... <laughs> yes, he has just um, severed the, uh, one of the wives' heads. She's sitting down there, and I just have to cut off her neck if you'll just bear with me. She's sitting down there, and she says, OK, now I get you. Uh, as all the wives did, they got the idea and apparently behaved perfectly after that. Yes. And so Swinza got the job. Yes. A head is uh, a very effective tool. Is anyone familiar with the book The Art of War? There must be someone who works in advertising or commercial radio. <laughs> <laughs> the Art of War, it's a very interesting book. If you, have, I, There's one in particular, one uh, instruction in that that I constantly tell my children actually. Which is, some of them are logical, some of them are barbaric, but this one in particular is never go into battle without knowing what you're trying to achieve. Yeah. It's perfectly sensible yes. when you think of any conflict in your life, what am I actually trying to achieve here? Yeah. Anyway, I tell them, I didn't listen to myself, but I do tell them. Good writing tip. It is a good writing tip, maybe I should apply it to that. <laughs> All right, now could you tell us, just in terms of the value of life in those days. Now a woman's life had very little value. A child under six had very little value, is that correct? I, I, I think I read that in your book that the... Yes. Yeah, that um, children under six, there were no mourning rights for children under six, whereas the mourning rights, of course, for um, adults, uh, and particularly male head of the family, were quite complex. And they involved you know, mourning clothes and uh, various other things. And then, of course, you see when you've got someone like the emperor that his burial rites are just phenomenal and he has to have a whole underground city and an army created for him, as you can see in the um, fabulous exhibition here. Now, can you tell us what... And, and if, I've got the book here if you could read it to us. In terms of the existence for most people, the males often forced into uh, the army. Mm -hmm. was, was that right? Uh, yeah, most people's occupation would have been, as pretty much still is in China today, working on the land. And, and it's those people that would have been uh, made up for sort of the basic army, yes. What you see in the exhibition would be the crack troops, the professional guys. Yeah. And these poor farmers, dirt poor farmers, were taxed yep. quite excessively. Yep, that's right. Whenever the emperor felt like he needed more money or, you know, a new army with new weapons, he just whacked on another tax. Now, can you explain, does anybody know the, the emergence of the first emperor, how he actually came to be? No. Good. Now, can you... Let's start. We've got this man who was a hostage. Yeah, we've got a child who was a hostage. Uh, and then his father goes back to his original home state, which was the state of Qin. And remember that, because it comes into play later in the English language, even. We have a word that comes from that. Um, his father goes back to the home state of Qin. He becomes king for a fairly short while. Um, he dies in mysterious circumstances. And a little boy, the little boy, whose name is Prince Zheng, he becomes the king at the age of 12. Uh, and when I tell kids that, of course, they're really impressed. <laughs> Most but, of them would like to be a king as well. <laughs> but there's a bit of trickiness there too, isn't there? Because yep. the son who's sent as the hostage... So imagine we've got these warring states yep. and Fred and Bob are fighting and they say, all right, I'll keep this treaty with you. You can have my son as a hostage. Well, you don't give your good son. You give your crappy one, <laughs> all right? And the crappy one knows he's crappy. He's right down the bottom, isn't he? Yeah, he's about number 20. He's number 20. So he's over there in this faraway land until a man gets in his ear, yep. a businessman. Yep. Would you like to follow yes, through? Yes, a businessman called Lu is his name, L-U. Uh, and he, the businessman meets this young prince and goes, oh, hmm, opportunity to make a bit of money here. And uh, goes back to his father and said, what do you reckon we invest in this guy? And... Um, his father goes, yes, let's do it. 
and they cook up this kind of idea where uh, Lu goes back to the queen mother or, uh, who has no children and says, would you like to adopt this young prince? He's such a nice guy. And she does. Uh, and that sort of jumps him up into um, first position in terms of um, being heir to the throne. And there's a lot of this negotiating that goes on. So here we've got this fellow who's essentially a businessman who goes to the favourite first wife, who's never had children, and says, if you adopt this one, yep. of course she then becomes more powerful anyway. Yep. But what it does is take the crappy little son and suddenly he yep. is the first in line. Yep. And he's the one who decides, he's king, and then he decides at the age of 20 or so that he would like to be, he would like to take on the role of his that power. That was actually his father who was the hostage. He, Oh, right, okay, yeah. yes, you're absolutely Prince right. Prince was born into the hostage situation, but he ends up back in his homeland, acceding to the throne at the age of 12, and then at about the age of 20-ish or thereabouts, he becomes an adult, um, has to live, face down a palace coup, first of all, but does eventually uh, take the reins of power from him, off his mother and Lu as well. Uh, and from then on begins a series of campaigns and one by one defeats the other six states. Until finally in 221 BC, China is united for the first time under one man and he gives himself the new title of Qin Shi Huang, which, or Qin Shi Huang Di, which means Qin, that's the land he came from, Shi is the first, Huang Di is emperor. So he invents the title of emperor for himself to show how grand and and omnipotent he is. Um, and if, as I said, if you remember the word Qin, it, it basically our word China now comes from that. It's the same root word. So China is the land of Qin, the land of the Qin Emperor. Thank you. Now, Terry, what are you doing flaunting your words over there? <laughs> yes, explain it to us, please. Eventually, he loses uh, control of the world, I think. Mean, yeah, this is Mr. Lu you're talking about here. Uh, yes. No, it's, it's um, King Lu Shang when he dies. Right. Now, Lu Shang was the one who was the Prime Minister? Lu Shang. Yes, was the Prime Minister in the century before the First Emperor, who um, built up the state of Qin into a military machine, basically. Um, and uh, when he lost power, he was. Uh, he kicked back. <laughs> it's messy. What happened was that he was pulled apart by uh, horses or chariots? I can't remember. There were I two of them. Three, but there were two of them who had this particular fate. Um, this was chariots, I think. Um, chariots and horses. Horses and chariots. And, chariots. <laughs> and the other one was horses. Not a great way to die. Um, in this one, we are out of chariots, so Lord Shane suggested we use horses instead. <laughs> um, <that's laughs> That's what you call a slow death. And usually, uh, when, uh, when someone like this died, not only did he die, but um, his wife died, uh, his children died, his extended family died, and they even went into trouble of killing all the pets as well. But what? Yeah, and it's good that you've mentioned that because while we're here, we're celebrating this extraordinary achievement downstairs. When when you see it, it it's gobsmacking, and it's two thousand years old. This exhibition. Not the exhibition yeah. here, obviously, but the, the <laughs> sculptors. Facts, yeah. <laughs> but what we need to keep in perspective here is the sheer megalomania required to focus so many people. Is it, actually, is it 700,000 people worked on this? Yes. Approximately 700,000 people were employed building these soldiers. Now, one of the great fears of the first emperor was death. And this is all about making sure, well, he tried to be immortal, yeah. but should he not have succeeded, this was making sure that the afterlife was fine. Could you give us some examples of the megalomania? Because it's terrific to celebrate this achievement, yeah. and it is extraordinary, but he was a cruel, insane man, wasn't he? Oh, yes. There's no doubt about it. He was a real military dictator, yes. Um, he had... A thing about he was extremely superstitious um, and quite obsessed with immortality. Um, his lucky number was six, according to I don't know some 
fortune teller or other. And so he had this thing where all his laws, um, his six was his favourite number. So the hats had to be six inches high. And if you go and have a look at the hat the general wears in the exhibition, the hats were by law six inches high. Um, and there were multiples of six in some of the other uh, laws that he had, the width of the roads and all kinds of things. Um, but it's quite interesting that he viewed himself as being something of a saviour for China, really. Um, he has these stone inscriptions made. Whenever he loves going on tours of his realm, and he has stone inscriptions made on top of mountains whenever he went on these little, you know, holidays around his country. And um, his inscriptions say things about how wonderful he is and how he's brought peace and security and how everybody knows their place in his land. And the idea is that, you know, at last, after centuries and centuries of chaos and destruction, at last the land has peace. And he obviously saw it as being um, a necessary measure, that these, you know, really strict and bloodthirsty measures were necessary to govern the country. You know, as Lord Shun says, uh, it takes the wicked to rule the good. That's what he, that's their, that was their argument. Well, and, and neither can the kind. Wasn't that his? Kindness is the mother of crime. Kindness is the mother of crime. Well, yes. certainly is in our quote house. From Lord yes, yes. <laughs> yes. But he also did a thing. I remember he went on a picnic. This emperor. I'm not yes. sure if it was an emperor at that time. Yes, he went on a picnic right. to a beautiful idyllic mountain. And, and decided that it was a bit underpopulated, and he'd just uproot a couple of hundred thousand people, please, and move them. So that he could have was it 300,000 people he made move remember. to this valley? Yes. Yeah, I think it was something like that. Yes. But he achieved other important things. Can you yes. just tell us about the currency? And yes, yes. You'll notice uh, in the exhibition you'll be able to see some examples of coins that were used in the warring states and uh, the coins, the standard coins that um, became traditional throughout China for millennia. Um, were the round ones, and that was an introduction of um, the king, of, of the emperor, sorry. Um, he was very systematic. I would have thought he, he had a definite eye for detail, and he had everything systematised. He wanted the language systematised, he wanted the written characters systematised, he wanted the width of his roads and the height of his hats and the, t the shape of his coins, and everything had to be the way he said, basically. And he used to sign the documents in those days were made of bamboo and he used to sign it was said you know several kilograms worth of bamboo documents a day he also um, made a tree a junior grand master so he actually oh, yes. made a tree one of his advisors is that yes right? that's correct yes that was the same uh, picnic as um as the one where he decided to move the people yes there was a storm on the way back down the mountain and um they, he and his retinue sheltered under a tree and it kept him nice and dry and safe. And so at the end of the, uh, the storm, he decided to honour the tree by giving it a title. So, yes, I would have thought that would be one of his more... Um, uh, Gentle? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> one of his more... His, his uh, less obnoxious advisors, yes. Now, before we get finally to what what his agenda really is with mm -hmm. the statues downstairs so that we can understand this mad headspace. Mm -hmm. Terry, could you just talk us qu quickly through some of your other beautiful cartoons there? If I must. You must. Okay. <laughs> we go again. This is um, to do with uh, the great respect that uh, a Chinese son would always have for his father or grandfather. So he's going to the grave to ask his father, remind me, father, should I go on my noodles for three minutes or four? And they seem to go to an extensive uh, respect. We don't kind of have that rule so much here. Um, there was, this is, uh, I think it's the um, second one, the, the actual camera, testing, um, testing poisons on a blade. And his method of testing poisons was to get slave line up and to put the poison on his blade and to um, stab the uh, slave and if the slave died quickly, that was good poison. If you did, not so good. Thank you, slave, you've been most helpful. <laughs> um, this is 
I was hungry, sister, so I ate your meal too. Okay, my brother, I'll just call Nora, my lady. The, uh, the great um, boys are superior, uh, girls inferior. Uh, that was ran through the whole civilization. Yeah. You probably can say more about that. Yeah, so food is short, the boy gets the best food. Uh, the boy gets first choice of the meal on the table, the boy gets the meat, the girl misses out. Yeah, th and there's actually a satirical poem um, about that, and it, it basically says, you know, uh, if you have a boy, don't let him eat. If you have a girl, feed her your meat. Uh, for we know the great wall is built upon piles of our son's skeletons. And that's, that's my translation of an actual column of the day. Scans well, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but this also, of course, meant that the women were... Well, many people were uneducated, but the women yep. were absolutely inferior. If you didn't yep. have a partner or if you were widowed, your life was absolute misery, wasn't it, mm. as a female? Yes, it was. Um, and Maud's, who's actually one of the most humanitarian of the ancient Chinese writers... Um, and says some very, argues passionately against war, but he's the one that I found a quote where he says, um, every girl of 15 should have herself a master, by which he means she should be married. Mm. And what's the next one you got there? This one he relates to uh, when the, the emperor of China finally died. Um, they would. <laughs> they weren't too keen to, uh, to announce this too quickly, so he was on a long journey to China. They, um, they decided that they would leave him uh, in the uh, chariot for quite a few days, even though he was starting to go, go off and the clients were descending to work out what they would do to replace him. They even attached a, uh, a load of uh, old fish to the back of uh, the chariot so that would, uh, people would think, well, that's what the smell is. And so as the emperor started to go off, they, um, they sent a, a message out. The emperor had actually written a message to his son, who was out in the mainland, saying, come back and you will be king, basically. That, emperor, that uh, message was changed by the emperor's... Um, Enemies? Let's say sister, who, <laughs> who uh, was uh, much more keen on uh, maybe one of his friends becoming uh, the emperor. So they changed the message to the, um, the emperor says, you should, uh, you should kill yourself. Fall on your sword, which the obedient uh, son did, fell on his sword. And so there was someone else put in his place, and that's uh, he was not very smart according to this. For those who can't see, he falls on the wrong end of the sword and just bruises his stomach. <laughs> It was Maud's again that um, tells us about some of the rites and uh, one of the weirder things that you're supposed to do when you're mourning, apart from you're supposed to you know, go and live in a hut and uh, sleep on the earth and, uh, and one of the weirder things that you're not supposed, supposed to do is you're supposed to cry of course but you're not allowed to wipe away the snot. So that's what inspired Terry with this particular one. Wipe your nose, Bing Lee, that's disgusting. But Mother, I'm just showing respect for our dead emperor. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Terry. They're beautiful. Thank you. Now, I know we, we have to finish, but I just wonder, can you, can you finally tell us... Mm. And this was, sorry, to interrupt myself. One of the reasons that the emperor was caught short is if, the, if you're seeking immortality and you are a megalomaniac, you don't think you're going to die. So you don't have a plan B. All right, so when he became ill, this empire that had only taken about 30 years to construct, perhaps less, was suddenly on, on the brink of disarray, wasn't it? Yes. So could you just take us through the last little bit? We've seen the rise of the empire mm. and now the sudden collapse, which didn't take long at all. Yep, the emperor dies in 210 BC. By 206 BC, uh, well, two in 210 BC, by 206 BC, we've been through two more rulers and another civil war. And finally, uh, a new, um, the Han Dynasty is established at the end of that period. Uh, I think it's kind of ironic that, um, you know, for someone who was desperate to have immortality, 
uh, and he and wanted to get it through this tomb in a funny kind of way. He's actually achieved that, and he's got worldwide fame. Yep, yeah. great point. And for everybody who's going down to look at the exhibition, could you just give a few pointers, things to keep an eye out for? Oh, look, it's fantastic. I don't know what to point you to. Um, myself, I love the statues. I just love the faces. You know, you know that they were very probably modelled on real people, and to think that I'm looking at the faces of, you know, real men from back in those times, who the ones that feature in these stories, that's what really um, moves me. So the emperor was buried, a, a hill was yep, constructed, over, constructed him. over him. Yep. There are, I'm getting my thousands muddled. Um, how many thousand soldiers have we got down here? Someone eight. will know. That's random. Sure Is it all right? Let's say eight. We've Don't got, make me look at the book. no. <laughs> So we've got 8,000 soldiers there, but what we also found in other areas <clears throat> that are since being uh, discovered is that he wasn't just wanting to be protected, he wanted entertainment with acrobats, with musicians, the beautiful uh, sculptured, uh, are they swans that we see down very long necked beautiful swans? Keep an eye out for all of this and imagine that this is a man who's believing that should he die, he will be living in this space. So he's recreating his heaven on earth for yes. the afterlife. And it's very interesting to see what heaven is to him. To, heaven, to him, heaven means to be a person of power and might, obviously. It also mm. means there aren't many women there. So. Well, no, actually, the, he had <laughs> every wife that had not born a son was buried alive with him. I know, but they didn't get a sculpture. No, they got to be the real thing. <laughs> they got to be dead. And also the people who worked on it were also killed, weren't they? Yes, that's right. Yes, because they realised at the, at the end um, that all the artisans knew the secrets of what was in there and how to get it. Um, so they decided just to shut the door on them at the end of the process. 700,000. Uh, not all 700,000. I don't think they would have fitted them all in, but perhaps some of the key people, yeah. And it was done over a long, long time too. So yes, whoever they could find. <laughs> They buried in there with the wives. So I, I, it's too many years of history to cover in 30 minutes, uh, but it is totally fascinating. If you do get a chance, is this book in the shop downstairs? Yes, it is. It's, it's wonderful. It, it's simplistic, it's got a sense of humour, and it's poignant. So do grab it. it it's written for 12-year-olds, but I loved it. And the cartoons are fantastic. And our wonderful writer, Alison, and illustrator, Terry. <laughs> no, I was about to say something cheeky and I thought, no, don't do that. Uh, they'll both be signing the books. Where will you be doing that? In the shop? Over in the bookshop. So come and say hello. Buy a copy of the book because it summarises all of this time magnificently. And I hope that you really enjoy having a look at the exhibition. Thank you for your time. It's been great. And thank you very much to Alison and to Terry.